Jesus. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I've just let you all in for another one of our hopefully fascinating talks. Uh, today, we've got um, Philip Ball, the well-known science writer, who got to talk to us on the absolutely fascinating subject of Paracelsus, and I'm sure nobody could do it better than he can. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you. Thank you very much for coming. And while we are still letting people in, I will ask Philip to talk a bit about himself and how he came to be writing a book about Paracelsus. I hope he's okay with that. And I have to unmute him because the rest of you are muted. Hmm. Um, one second. Yeah. Okay, Philip, you should be unmuted now. Can you say something that I can confirm that fact? Yeah, does, can you can you hear this? Yes, yes, I can hear this fine. You're no. good and clear. <clears throat> Tell us a bit about yourself. <laughs> okay, sure. Well, um, I am a freelance. Um, I suppose I call myself a science writer. Most of the writing I do is about science, but increasingly it's or very often it's been about the history of science. Um, so I'm not a professional historian. I was actually going to say a little bit about the the genesis of this uh, this this book, which I have here in uh, in my talk. But I will say it now up front. Um, it's a biography of Paracelsus, and um, I, I should, you know, I had no desire actually to be anyone's biographer uh, when I started science writing. It's not something that occurred, had occurred to me before I wrote this book, which was written in 2006. So it's going back quite a way. I had no experience, not only as a biographer, but neither as a historian. Um, and my aim could never be to sort of uncover new ground in the uh, analysis of Paracelsus's life and his influence. Everything that I wrote in this book, of course, depends on the diligent work of specialist historians of science and historians of the, the Renaissance, of the era in which he lived. Um, but I, I guess I felt that um, I, I hadn't encountered a biography of Paracelsus previously that seemed to convey how he fitted in with the social and the scientific currents of um of of his time you find if you come across him in popular accounts of science um I, I guess they tend to uh to suffer from what many popular accounts of science of, of the history of science suffer from a kind of a, a slight sort of presentism which is kind of trying to separate you know the good from the bad as it were the things that are correct by today's standards from the things that aren't so we have you know the talk about the janus face of of newton who you know on the one hand was an alchemist and on the other hand was a theorist of gravitation um and then on the other hand um there are some scholarly very good scholarly works uh, about paracelsus i'm going to mention a couple more recent ones in my talk but um you know there were ones by professional historians of science which dive deeply into the whole sort of mess of confusion of his ideas and the early modern period in which he worked but they're very much addressed at academics and um you know they rarely gain any public visibility and i think they're certainly not the kind of thing that a general reader would uh be able to to approach and it felt to me that um, I really wanted general readers of all sorts to encounter this chap, Paracelsus, because he is such a fascinating character um, from such a fascinating time. So I felt, you know, I would have to have a shot at doing the job. And um, that's how it how it ended up. OK, well, thank you very much, Peter. I'm amazed to say that we've got 65 people here. Not quite a record for all these seminars, but certainly a record for the particular a group of seminars, so congratulations on that, Philip. So please, can you start to tell us about Paracelsus and the world of Renaissance magic and science? Peter, Philip, over to you. Sure. Uh, now, hopefully now I will be able to share my screen and... Sharing it, but you need to put it in slide view. Yeah. You're on it now. Lovely. Very good. Okay. Um, yes, so Paracelsus has been all things to all sorts of people. Um, there's a poem by Robert Browning, simply called Paracelsus, written in 1834, in which he's sort of portrayed as a, a romantic hero. To many, uh, many romantics and mystics have, have idolised him, from Goethe to William Blake to, I wouldn't say, uh, Jorge Luis Borges is a mystic, but he's uh, certainly, he was a fan of Paracelsus. On the other hand, Paracelsus was commandeered as a kind of Germanic folk hero by the Nazis. 
And the the biographies that were written about him in the late 19th and early 20th century, um, biographies by people like Anne Stoddart and Franz Hartmann, um, uh, seem to me painfully determined to make him into a kind of noble, misunderstood genius. And he, had cro he crops up in all kinds of places. He crops up in novels by A.S. Byatt, by Robertson Davies, by Jeanette Winterson. And there's even a bust of Paracelsus in the corridors of Hogwarts. So he's become kind of a legendary wizard, really. Um, yet elsewhere, he's invoked scorn and fury. In the 18th century, the Swiss doctor Johann Georg Zimmermann called him a jackass and said of him that he lived like a pig, looked like a coachman and took pleasure in the company of the lowest, loosest and lowest mob. And a mere 60 years ago, a medical historian named H.P. Bayon had this to say about Paracelsus. He said, it cannot be said that the abusive rantings of Paracelsus contributed to the general progress of science and medicine that began in the 16th century, for he was a rude, circuitous obscurantist, not a harbinger of light, knowledge and progress. Um, and Bayon concludes that he was violently destructive, only rarely critically constructive and never original, if ever right. So, you know, it seems to me that that some of this, um, the, the response he, he invokes, is, is more than dismissive. It's angry. It seems that even in modern times, scientists and historians can be provoked and dismayed and, and embarrassed by Paracelsus. They don't know what to do with him. The, 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 the fact is that these polarised responses um, were apparent even during Paracelsus's own lifetime and the immediate aftermath of that. He's never been other than controversial. And that's apparent from the, the best first hand account that we have of the impression that Paracelsus made on those around him. And this is an account that appears in a letter of 1555 written to Johann Weyer, uh, a physician to the Duke of Cleves, who um, is, is, is best known for his book um, on the activities of demons, in which he argued that uh, rather bravely and rationally that it was wrong to burn witches because they're not actually evil and in league with the devil but it merely deluded and mad now um in 1555 Vea was gathering information about magic from those who knew about it and one of the people he contacted was someone known as operinus um the uh, a, a, a scholar and a publisher are uh, in Baal, whose actual name was johannes herbst but in the in the manner of the the renaissance he took this latinate title operinus Operinus had already made his own mark on history when in 1543 he published De Humani Corporis Fabrica on the fabric of the human body, the great book of anatomy uh, by the physician Andreas Vesalius. It's a, really the, one of the seminal textbooks of the Renaissance. Um, but when Vea wrote to uh, Operinus, it wasn't uh, Vesalius that he was asking after. He was more interested in the man for whom Operinus and I've got a picture of Operinus here. Um, oh, sorry. In fact, I first of all have a picture of Paracelsus now. I'm not going to be able to have to move this manually. There we go. So here's Paracelsus. Uh, this is a portrait from him uh, in his lifetime. Here's Operinus. Um, and uh, Operinus acted as a secretary for Paracelsus, uh, a secretary and an assistant. Um, so Vea said, OK, tell me what he was really like. And so Operinus told him, this is what he said. It's quite a long, I probably won't read all of this, but it's so uh, wonderful that I, I, I may be tempted to. Operinus said, as to Paracelsus, he's been dead for a long time. And so I should hate to speak against the spirit of his death, as the saying goes. While he was living, I knew him so well that I, sh that I should not desire to live with such a man again. Apart from his miraculous and fortunate cures in all kinds of sickness, I've noticed in him neither scholarship nor piety of any kind. The two years I passed in his company, he spent in drinking and gluttony night and day. Nevertheless, when he was when he was most drunk and came home to dictate to me, he was so consistent and logical that a sober man could not have improved upon his manuscripts. All night, as long as I stayed with him, he never undressed, which I attributed to his drunkenness. Often he would come home tipsy uh, after midnight, throw himself on his bed in his clothes, wearing his sword, which he said he had obtained from a hangman. He had hardly time to fall asleep when he arose, drew his sword like a madman, threw it on the ground or against the wall, so that sometimes I was afraid he would kill me. He was a spendthrift, 
so that sometimes he had not a penny left. Yet the next day he would show me a full purse. And he goes on and on and on like this. So it's a uh, it certainly gives the impression of this very, very colorful, uh, slightly intimidating person. If any of this is true, and it's not obvious, actually, that Alperinus had any reason to to lie, he didn't really have any axe to grind, although sometimes um, uh, Paracelsus's biographers have made him out to be a scheming villain to try to rescue Paracelsus's reputation. But if what Alperinus says is true, then it suggests that what we're looking at here is a rather strange and difficult man. Uh, which is no doubt awful if uh, you're his secretary, but actually rather attractive if you're his biographer. Um, now, as I say, I wrote this book uh, some time ago. Since that time, um, there have been uh, a, at least two other books about Paracelsus. Um, one, the, uh, so this is um, the uh, the original printing of my book, The Devil's Doctor. And um, that, yeah, there has been this uh, book uh, that appeared four years ago now, in 20, 2019, by Bruce Moran, Paracelsus and Alchemical Life, which I heartily recommend. It finds a really nice balance between the academic and the accessible. Um, and uh, a slightly more academic treatment is uh, Charles Webster's Paracelsus, Medicine, Magic and Mission at the End of Time. This was published in 2008. Um, Paracelsus was the name that uh, he adopted in, as I say, the characteristic Latinate tradition of the uh, of the Renaissance. We don't quite know what that name is meant to mean, uh, although it, some say that it was intended to suggest that uh, Paracelsus's knowledge extended beyond that of the famous Greek philosopher Celsus. He was born Philip Theophrastus von Hohenheim um, into a family of impoverished Swabian nobles in the uh, Swiss village of Einsiedeln, a small town, a uh, small village really near Zurich um, in 1493. And uh, here's a near contemporary um, illustration or map of the uh, of the village. They were uh, he lived appropriately enough near the de so-called Devil's Bridge. And this is a photo of how it looks today. It's still there. Um, now, 1493 was uh, quite a momentous year in a way. It was a year in which Christopher Columbus returned from the New World. It was uh, during that time uh, uh, Michelangelo was an apprentice in Florence. Leonardo da Vinci was entertaining the Duke of Milan. Titian was two years old. So this was the period approaching the High Renaissance, the dawn, as we're often told, of a golden age. Um, well, this was really one of the, pop the the popular ideas about this time that I wanted to challenge in my book, because the truth is that Renaissance Europe was in many ways, and to most people, a terrible place. It was racked by wars of increasing scale and violence. And on top of that, people lived in constant fear um, and terror of, of famine and plague, uh, which returned to all major cities every uh, few years. There was cholera, there was dysentery, tuberculosis, leprosy. All of this meant that you were lucky if you lived until 40. During that time, you could expect a lot of pain and suffering. Between two and five children out of every 10 died before their first birthday. Surgery, if you could afford it, was torture. And much of the medicine of the day was useless or worse. Um, so it was a time of disease and death, and there's good reason to suggest that Europe was driven half mad by it. It seemed to revel in that age in ghoulish depictions of death and decay. So in such an age, the dream of miracle working doctors was perhaps almost a psychological necessity. And I think we understand nothing about the essence of Paracelsus's life until we recognize that context. Paracelsus's father, Wilhelm, studied medicine at the University of Tübingen, and he became the town doctor in Einsiedeln. Um, and from his father, Paracelsus seemed to acquire a knowledge of the healing herbs in the uh, local vicinity and a love of natural history. And when Wilhelm was, for political reasons, forced to move to the town of Villach in Carinthia in 1502, there, his son learned the crafts of mining and metallurgy because Vinac was a mining town, uh, a place surrounded by rich mineral resources. So in the laboratories and the smelting houses of the mining companies, Paris, uh, uh, Paracelsus served an apprenticeship in a very practical form of alchemy. Now, to become a doctor, 
And he started to, uh, he set out to do this at the age of just 14. And to do that, he he studied at the universities in Germany. Now, in those days, um, students didn't just enroll in a particular university. They typically wandered from place to place, seeking out the best teachers. So Paracelsus, as a young man, went to Tübingen, to Heidelberg, to Mainz, Treves, Cologne, many other schools. He was looking for a spirit of inquiry, he said, but what he found was an expectation that students would simply learn their medicine from the books of the ancient scholars, from people like Aristotle, Hippocrates and Galen and their Islamic interpreters from the early Middle Ages, such as Avicenna. That was what scholarship was uh, tended to mean in those times, because uh, many academics believed that everything worth knowing had already been discovered by the Romans and Greeks or by their Islamic successors. And so that all one needed to do was to study what these people had written. Experience counted for nothing. And to question what these ancient books said could be tantamount to heresy. The greatest medical authorities of the time were the Greek Hippocrates and the Roman doctor, or Greek Roman really, Dr. Galen. They asserted that our health is governed by the four bodily fluids known as the humours. Um, so these four are blood, phlegm and black and yellow bile. It was believed that illness resulted from an imbalance of these humours and the doctor's task was to try to restore their balance by drugs or by diet or commonly by bloodletting. Now, academic doctors in the Middle Ages uh, adopted the humoral system as the theoretical basis of their work, but its connection to their daily practices actually seemed to be rather tenuous. Very often, uh, you know, very often they prescribed drugs made from herbs or minerals, which would be sold according to the doctor's prescription by the apothecaries at the time. They were really the medieval pharmacists. And to make a diagnosis, doctors would often practice uroscopy. This meant inspecting the patient's urine. And we see a doctor doing precisely that here. They claim to be able to deduce how the patient's humours were out of balance by looking at the colour and the consistency of their urine. And using this te technique, they often didn't have to actually see the patient at all. Uh, but nevertheless, they tended to charge high fees for their services so that only well-off people like merchants and nobles could generally afford to use them. And it meant the doctors were eminent in society and often dressed rather lavishly, as you can see from this one here. Now, Paracelsus despised all of this. He had no time for the doctor's disdain of manual work, and he hated the way they paraded their wealth around. Worse still, he considered that the foundation of classical medicine with its doctrine of humours was fundamentally mistaken. When he discovered that uh, that at university becoming a doctor was a matter of simply learning and memorizing the books of people like Galen and Avicenna, he was outraged. He insisted that it was only through experience, not through book learning, that one could become a true healer. Nevertheless, he somehow gained his Bachelor of Arts degree in 1512. And then he set off to complete his medical training in the Italian city of Ferrara, which was a progressive city in the Republic of Venice. Um, and he left there in 1515. Uh, and for the next eight or nine years, he seemed to wander the length and breadth of Europe, allegedly from Seville to Moscow, from Scotland to Alexandria. He became involved in several wars. He passed through very remote and hazardous places. And if the stories of his travels are reliable, and probably some are not, then it's quite astonishing that he survived all of this at all. He was searching for knowledge, and he believed it could be found everywhere, not just in books and colleges, but from the common folk of towns and villages, from wild barbarians, from mystics in Constantinople. He said, or he wrote, the arts are not all confined within one's fatherland, but they are distributed over the whole world. Not, uh, not that they are in one man alone or in one place. On the contrary, they must be gathered together, sought out and captured wherever they are. And he said, wherever I went, I eagerly and diligently investigated and sought after the tested and reliable arts of medicine. I went not only to doctors, but also to barbers, bath keepers, learned physicians, women and magicians who pursue the art of healing. I went to alchemists, to monasteries, to noble and common folk, to the learned and the simple. I've got to 
picture here, a map here of where those journeys may have taken him. Um, I say may, I'd recommend taking some of this with a pinch of salt. Certainly his uh, exploits in Great Britain and Scandinavia and Egypt and Russia um, are questionable. Um, there's a lot of a legend attached to Paracelsus and certainly one of the big challenges for me was to negotiate a path through all of that, to acknowledge the possibilities but uh, also the uncertainties. Certainly, he seemed to have gone uh, travel quite right, widely in Italy and uh, in in central uh, and, and northern Europe. So, in Italy and the Netherlands, he served as a military surgeon, which would have been a ghastly job, not only because it was dangerous, but because of the and, and and because of the combat, but because of the diseases that accompanied armies everywhere. In Constantinople and Alexandria, he allegedly learned the secrets of magic and alchemy, and he's said to have been one of the last people to leave by boat during the siege of Rhodes when it fell to the Ottoman Emperor Suleiman the Magnificent in 1522. So by the time Paracelsus returned again from these adventures to his father's house in Villac uh, in 1524, Europe had become a different place. I mean, there were still perpetual wars, there was still famine and plague, but now there was another cause of strife too, because it was in 1521 that Martin Luther had been condemned for heresy by the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V and the papal representatives at the Diet of Worms. By 1522, Luther had published his new translation in German of the, um, of the Bible, the New Testament, and the Reformation was underway. So the whole of Christendom was gradually splitting into camps that would become known as the Catholics and the Protestants. In the Swiss cantons, the uh, religious reforms were being spearheaded by Ulrich Zwingli, whose ideas were rather similar to Luther's, although the two men quarrelled, but then Luther quarrelled with pretty much everyone. This religious tension was an important component of Paracelsus's historical setting, not least because he considered himself something of a theologian too, although his ideas on many points of Christian doctrine were too unorthodox for any of these camps. Luther's result, uh, re revolt also became entangled with social unrest in the 1520s, uh, triggered by the harsh and high-handed way that peasants and ordinary people were often treated by the princes and nobles. And so to add to the religious turmoil, anarchic nonconformists known as Anabaptists began denouncing the Roman church. And in 1524, this led to the so-called Peasants War, in which some of these radicals were brutally suppressed by the nobility of southern Germany. Paracelsus fell foul of this conflict when he went to Salzburg to set up a medical practice because he fancied, as I say, fancied himself as a theologian, and he began to preach in his unorthodox way in taverns and inns and succeeded in upsetting pretty much everyone. When the peasants of Salzburg ran, rose up against their leaders, Paracelsus, despite supporting the rebels, had made himself unpopular enough that he had to flee the city in haste. And he flew, he fled to, or ended up at least, in Strasbourg in, um, in, in 1526. Uh, but from there, he, he soon headed to Baal, where he was, uh, where he'd been summoned by the humanist publisher Johannes Froben, um, who at the same time was uh, apparently giving lodgings to the great humanist scholar Erasmus of Rotterdam. So Paracelsus apparently cured uh, Froben's dodgy leg and may have treated Erasmus for gout. Thanks to the advocacy of the influential Zwinglian reformist priest uh, Ecolampadius, Paracelsus was also made town physician in Baal. Um, uh, so this was this was really a political move. Um, uh, it was a, an attempt to sort of undermine the, what was perceived as the papist tendency in the university. Um, but it backfired once Paracelsus supporters discovered the kind of man they were dealing with. Uh, because Paracelsus wasn't interested in that sort of politics. Uh, but nevertheless, he managed to outrage the entire medical uh, faculty with his unorthodox medical teachings. And in the summer of 1527, he laid out his curriculum, his new curriculum in con confrontational terms. He denied the doctrine of the humours. And it's said that he made his point in very theatrical fashion um, on the celebrations of St. John's Day in, in midsummer, when great bonfires were, were uh, you know, were by tradition li uh, lit in the marketplace. And there, apparently surrounded by students, he cast the collected works of Avicenna into the flames. 
Well, things went from bad to worse, and ultimately Paracelsus made himself again so unpopular with everyone that he had to flee the city under cover of darkness. And really, he never enjoyed such influence anywhere again. But in his subsequent wanderings throughout, mostly the, throughout the German lands, um, he began to record his theories and treatments in a series of books. The earliest of these, of Paracelsus' books, in fact, uh, date from around 1520, and it's not clear how many he actually wrote. Uh, it's quite likely that some will have been lost. Some uh, writings were attributed to him that he probably never wrote at all, um, and uh, certainly he struggled to get any of them published during his lifetime. That didn't really happen until several years after his death. Now, there's no denying that these books are uh, difficult to understand, and not just because they're written in medieval Swiss German. He could sometimes write wonderfully and vividly, but more often he was verbose, repetitive, undisciplined, even ranting or simply incoherent. He liked to take old words and give them a new meaning, and to invent new words from a mixture of Latin, Greek, Italian, Hebrew, possibly Arabic even. His definitions were sometimes vague and obscure, sometimes he'd not really define a new word at all. And some historians uh, are convinced that nevertheless there is method in this madness, and if you dig deep enough, um, then the effort will pay off. You'll get to see what he's getting at. Some of uh, his early critics implied that the verbal thickets that he created were really smoke screens just to disguise his ignorance. Personally, I think Carl Jung has a more probable explanation for what's going on here. Jung um, is often criticised, quite justifiably to some degree, by modern historians of, of alchemy for what he wrote on, on alchemy. But I think with Paracelsus, he might have had some useful psychological insights because he suggested that Paracelsus was full of uh, unconscious and unresolved conflicts between the Christian and the pagan, between the humble and the proud man, the creator and the destroyer. And this, Jung said, created a pathology that Jung uh, claimed to recognise from his own clinical experience. Uh, he said certain symptoms tend to appear here. One of them is uh, in the use of language. One wants to speak forcefully in order to impress one's opponent. So one ex employs a special bombastic style uh, using neologisms that might be described as power words. And so the language, he says, swells up, overreaches itself, sprouts grotesque words distinguished only by their needless complexity. Um, and Jung comments on the irony that Paracelsus, who prided himself on teaching and writing in German for the common people, should have been the very one to concoct these intricate neologisms out of this you know, mixture of, of different languages. Nevertheless, I do think it's possible to construct a fairly clear picture of what at, at root Paracelsus believed. And that's what I want to try and give you a flavour of now. It would be fair, I think, to say that his was kind of one of the first theories of everything. It was a theory not just of natural phenomena, but of God and man, the universe and the Bible, history and geography and magic. Aristotle wrote on all manner of subjects, but he didn't bother himself too greatly to try to weave them all together into a seamless whole. Plato suggested some overarching fundamental principles, but he didn't trouble himself so much, at least in the writings that survive, uh, with many of the fine details. But Paracelsus seemed to want to explain it all, to go everywhere. His ideas were rooted in the tradition known uh, as Neoplatonism, which was derived from the teachings of Plato, but was shaped into a kind of mystical philosophy by the third century Greek philosopher Plotinus. Early Christian writers, such as St. Augustine, um, were heavily influenced by this basically pagan philosophy. And for Paracelsus, it was always important that his theories should be compatible with his own rather peculiar version of Christian theology. So he, you know, he, he, he was absolutely writing from a Christian perspective of sorts. One of the central ideas of this Neoplatonism that uh, became prominent in the, in the Renaissance is a correspondence between the macrocosm and the microcosm. So that events that occurred in the heavens and in the natural world, in the macrocosm, have direct analogies with the microcosm of the human body. And this correspondence provided the theoretical basis for a belief at that time in astrology, although Paracelsus was actually one of those who argued against the idea that, uh, that our fates are completely fixed by the stars. 
he proposed that the correspondence of micro and macrocosm meant that there were signatures in nature, as he called them, which revealed, for example, the medical uses of a plant so that those shaped like a kidney could be used to treat renal complaints, kidney complaints. And these, he said, were signatures or signs left by God to guide the physician towards the proper use of these herbal medicines. Neoplatonism was the foundation of the tradition known as natural magic. Um, and when, when magic was uh, denounced in the 16th century, which it sometimes was, this wasn't because it was deemed to be trickery and superstition, but because it was actually seen as impious. It was seen as witchcraft and sorcery done with the aid of demons. To charges like these, the, the, the key proponents of natural magic at this time, people like Marsilio Ficino and uh, Cornelius Agrippa, um, they replied that they were, what they were doing was simply manipulating the occult, which is to say the hidden, invisible forces of nature, generally to bring about things that would happen naturally anyway, but just to bring them about more quickly or in a different way. So all the alchemists were trying to do from this perspective was to make base metals mature into gold, something that actually was generally thought to happen anyway in the bowels of the earth, but only very, very slowly. So this is where we have to lay uh, preconceptions aside of the, you know, the 21st century scientific rationalists in order to understand what Paracelsus was saying and why. Occult is now a dirty word uh, or is often seen as that, but we have to remember that this is really all it means. It just means that something is hidden. So magnetism was an occult force, for example. Um, and everyone could see in the 16th century that, you know, occult forces like magnetism existed. Why else did um, uh, the compass needle point to the north? Why else did apples fall to the ground if it wasn't for some hidden force, some occult force? Uh, modern physics is actually, of course, full of occult forces in this sense. And the Neoplatonists believe that similarly, the stars release emanations, something perhaps uh, in between a force and a kind of gas that affected events on Earth. So for Paracelsus, nature was filled with um, uh, forces like this, including a life-giving healing force. And it was the doctor's task to concentrate that life force um, from the extracts of plants and animals and minerals into medicines. And what Paracelsus brought to this picture of natural magic was substantially, what well, was substantially new, was an alchemical perspective. For him, every natural phenomenon was essentially an alchemical process. So the rising of moisture from the earth and the falling back as rain was in the micro macro cosm correspondence was the equivalent of the distillation and condensation that went on in the alchemist's flask. Growth of plants and animals from seeds was a kind of alchemy too. And in fact, even the biblical creation of the world was for Paracelsus seen as basically an alchemical process, a separation, a separation of the earth from the waters. Now, on one level, this is clearly all a rather beautiful fantasy, but within it are elements that were central to early modern science. First of all, there's the notion of generality, that by examining one phenomenon, we can, we can understand others too. Um, we can use laboratory experiments to understand principles of geology and biology and even cosmology. Second, Paracelsus insisted that everything can be given a rational mechanical explanation. And the explanations that he, he sought or, or that he gave might have been quite wrong. Uh, and very often the phenomena that he sought to explain were purely imaginary in the first place. But he insisted that, that superstition appeal to the imponderable agency of demons or of God, that that isn't enough. That won't do. Rather, one should seek for rationalizations of what we see based on fundamental principles of a self-consistent system of natural philosophy. And by bringing an alchemical perspective to the study of life, Paracelsus helped to unify the sciences. Previously, alchemy had been about the transmutation of metals. Um, but for Paracelsus, the, its principal purpose was to make medicines. 
So just as alchemists could mimic the natural transmutation of metals, so could alchemical medicines uh, bring about uh, nat the natural process of healing. And in fact, this was possible, he said, because the human biology itself was a kind of alchemy. In one of his most fertile ideas, Paracelsus asserted that there's an alchemist inside each one of us, a kind of principle that he called the archaeus, which separates what's good from what's bad in the food and the drink that we ingest. So the archaeus uses the good matter to make flesh and blood, and the bad is expelled as waste. Paracelsus can be said then, I think, to have, uh, to have devised a kind of bioalchemy, a precursor to modern biochemistry, which indeed now regards nature as a superb chemist, a kind of uh, archaeus that takes molecules apart and puts them back together as the constituents of our cells. To do all this, um, Paracelsus had to extend the standard theory of metal-based alchemy. And according to the Islamic alchemists, all metals are composed of two basic ingredients, sulfur and mercury, or I should say philosophical sulfur and philosophical mercury, which weren't exactly the same as the stuff you could dig from the ground, the elements, um, as we now know them. To this pair, Paracelsus added a third component. He added uh, salt. So sulfur, salt and mercury, his so-called tria prima, were the constituents of all things, whether they were animal, vegetable or mineral. And the Paracelsian trio of elementary principles provided the basis for several later classifications of the elements. And in fact, it's possible to see how the Paracelsian sulfur eventually became the fictitious element phlogiston, the principle of fire, which gave chemists their first organizing principle until, of course, the phlogiston theory was replaced by the by Lavoisier's oxygen theory at the end of the 18th century. Well, I guess all I can do here is give you this most sketchy of outlines of uh, the, the theories of Paracelsus. Um, you might be inclined to ask, well, are they really science? Um, I'd suggest that that's not the right question to ask, as I'll uh, come to shortly. But first, I think I should finish his story arc, um, because uh, after Basel, um, uh, Paracelsus's fortunes waxed and waned a lot. He wandered here and there. He treated patients when he could. He was often penniless. He was mostly frustrated in his attempt to find publishers for his books. And in the early 1530s, he drifted like a tramp through Europe, sometimes seeming half mad, preaching a kind of humble Puritanism at inns and taverns. Here he is in Carniola in 1538, um, drawn by the artist Augustin Hirschvogel. He's 45 years old at this point. He looks more like 60, I think. And in 1540, he was summoned to Salzburg again. Uh, but by that stage, he was becoming too ill to work. And in September of 1541, he died in his room at the White Horse Inn, which still stands, it's now a bistro, um, and he was buried in Salzburg in the Church of St. Sebastian, uh, and later his remains were disinterred and placed within with, with the tombstone in a, sep in a sepulchre in the porch of the church, which is where it stands today. When Paracelsus' works were collected and published from the 1560s, they chimed with the tenor of the times. Suddenly they kind of seemed to hit a nerve and his, chem and his chemical medicine became championed by medical iconoclasts in France and Germany and England. And before long, doctors were faced with the, cho the choice of either aligning themselves with the traditional Galenists or with the new Paracelsians. And that's a complex story in itself, and one can't simply say that the Paracelsians won the battle, although their basic idea, the idea that specific medicines ne are needed to treat specific diseases, rather than the kind of general idea of balancing humours and bloodletting and so on, that idea is, of course, still at the core of modern medicine. So there's no doubt, I think, that Paracelsus's works were historically important. But what are we to think of them now? What are we to think of uh, someone who says that, for example, a man can survive without water if he's planted firmly in the earth? What has this got to do with science? Well, the truth is that there was no such thing as science in the 16th century and not in the books of Copernicus or Vesalius any more than in the books of Paracelsus. What there was instead were attempts to make sense of the world using reason and observation. And without that, science would never have been possible. 
one of the things that struck me most forcibly in exploring Paracelsus' story uh, was how much of the narrative of science's history has been cleaned up in retrospect so that it's now you know tends to be drawn with bold outlines and with a few heroes uh anointed and exalted so one of them of course is copernicus um and historians have often cited uh copernicus's uh great book uh, de revolutionibus as the beginning of what is traditionally called the scientific revolution and here, they say, is a break from the past that finally organizes nature in a way that is recognizably valid today. And that's true enough, but it tends to neglect both what Copernicus actually said and how it was perceived at the time. For one thing, P Copernicus stressed that because the heavens are essentially of infinite size, slightly displacing the Earth from the center, making the sun in the center uh, instead, doesn't really make much difference. It's a, you know, it's a it's virtually no displacement at all. And the primer on Copernican astronomy uh, called Narratio Prima that um, Copernicus's disciple Reticus wrote in 1540 had other themes entirely. It, it wasn't merely a synopsis of the heliocentric theory, but it was something more occult. It included a Kabbalistic celebration of the number six. It described how a moving earth could explain the changing fates of monarchs and how this new system might be used for astrological prediction. One of the main problems with the Ptolemaic system was not that it was cumbersome per se, but that it couldn't be trusted for making astrological prognostications. And it's possible that some readers of Copernicus's book were disappointed by it rather than elated or outraged because they found that Copernicus himself had, hadn't really pursued the astrological implications of his theory. At the same time, a Neoplatonist wouldn't have felt ex entirely excluded by this book because Copernicus reminds the reader of how the mythical founder of the Neoplatonic and alchemical tradition, Hermes Tri uh, Trismegistus, um, how uh, 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 th this person had called the sun the visible god. Um, and it, it, this isn't just a historical aside, it's a preparation for Copernicus saying that, you know what, placing the sun at the center of things, like, it, as he put it, as if resting on a kingly throne, is actually, you know, the more sort of apt way of doing things. Copernicus wrote that the state of immobility is regarded as more noble and godlike than that of change and instability. So, you know, these are really the themes that are going on there. And incidentally, um, Reticus, Copernicus's follower, was thoroughly uh, familiar with the occult tradition and was enthusiastic himself about the revival of Paracelsus's ideas in the 1560s and 1570s. Reticus uh, claimed to have composed several, uh, several books on alchemy himself, and uh, he claimed to have met and been oppressed by Paracelsus in person. In fact, the period after Paracelsus's death and before the rise of Isaac Newton is one of the most turbulent and difficult in the history of science in terms of explaining and understanding what, what happened and why. I recommend uh, this other book by uh, Charles Webster that deals with this period um, very, very nicely. And I think that's pr probably why it's, uh, it's seldom covered in popular accounts. Uh, you know, what we tend to find is um, that suddenly we make a quick leap from Copernicus to Galileo and maybe William Harvey, and that they're just stepping stones to the Royal Society and so on. Um, but there are no easy divisions and distinctions to be made here. For example, Harvey was a somewhat reactionary traditionalist who dismissed uh, Paracelsian ideas, while the progressive chemist and uh, physicist Andreas Libavius despised Paracelsus. So we can't easily say these ones were progressive, these ones were traditionalists and, you know, uh, and, and, and make distinctions about who prevailed. Um, and this was ultimately, um, all of this was bound up with the religious and the political currents of the time. And that's really what I wanted to suggest in my book. I wanted, as the Americans would, would, would say, I wanted to complicate the narrative. Because if you want a clear and coherent story about how science began, I don't think you'll find it in what actually transpired in this formative period. And I hope it's clear by now that there's certainly little point in hoping for a great deal of coherence in the life of Paracelsus. I decided that the only way to do it justice was to present both him and his age with all its turmoil and all its contradictions. That, after all, may be the best way to show how difficult it was 
for the people of this time to make sense of their world. And I believe it's after all, while the, uh, that, that is after all, why the sheer force of Paracelsus's personality in all its unruliness, that it's that that explains why he left such a mark on his times and why he continues to compel our attention today. Neither hero nor monster, or perhaps a bit of both. Um, he's a kind of magnification of all the conflicts of the human condition. He once wrote, I am different. Let this not upset you. In the event, it upset plenty of people then and since. But I think it's a difference worth celebrating. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Philip. Uh, an absolutely wonderful, wide-ranging talk delivered with such gusto. So thank you for that. Um, before we move on to the questions, and we don't really have that many questions, could I just mention this book? I hope it turned up the right, it looked back to front to me, but probably it was okay to the rest of you. This is a third volume of the Cultural History of Chemistry, and some of you may remember that this particular series started uh, basically with the whole idea of the Cultural History of Chemistry, which was published at the beginning of last year. And if you want to read that book, that volume three in the early modern age, it will explain in more detail some of Paracelsus' chemical ideas, but also the way he influenced his age. In fact, the, virtually the whole of this book, and don't forget, this is supposed to cover the whole of chemistry in the early modern age, which is the sort of 16th century and 17th century, it, it's completely filled with Paracelsus. You have chapter after chapter which deals with Paracelsus. So I recommend it to you. At the moment, it's hideously expensive to buy the whole six volume for cost you £400. But wait, it will be broken up. You will be able to get the individual volume and you might be able to get it £25 for £25 remaining eventually. So be patient and you'll eventually be able to get that book. Philip, one thing that struck me is that you did mention this, but how were Paracelsus regarded by contemporaries? Was he regarded as a quack or a great man or maybe a mixture of the two? <laughs> yes, um, I think a mixture of the two. And I think, you know, that some of the contemporary accounts that I, I gave of him uh, reflect that. So Erasmus, who he treated, as I say, was quite impressed by him. He gave it left a quite a sort of favourable account. Um, and... Uh, you know, as I say, Reticus, Copernicus's follower, uh, also was impressed. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, but where there are absolutely plenty who considered him uh, uh, not not necessarily just a quack, but, you know, that the, the, he, because he was tra challenging the old tradition, um, then, you know, clearly there were uh, vested interests and there were people who were going to want to dismiss and belittle him from that point of view. But I think that in Paracelsus's case, um, you know, he was his own worst enemy. He was constantly self-sabotaging himself that whenever he did get a chance to uh, exercise influence and in Baal in particular uh, was was the, the, the best chance he had, you know, he just managed to undermine himself and make himself so unpopular uh, that it that it just wouldn't last. So I think, it, you know, it's hard to disentangle sometimes re uh, the responses to his ideas from the responses to his personality and the way he conducted himself. Well, different if you like between his personality and what he was actually teaching. It would be interesting to relate that to modern scientists, but that would be too complicated an issue. But I mean, if there was somebody living, say a reasonably well-educated person living in the late uh, 16th century, so something like say 1580 or something like that, who would I, who would I, who would I know best? Would I know Copernicus best or Paracelsus best? Who who would be the best known number two to me? Yeah, that's a good question. And do you know, I I I don't feel uh, confident in 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 uh, fully answering that. But I have to say, I suspect it would be um, Paracelsus rather than Copernicus. Um, you, I mean, you know, if you were a doctor, then you you probably know Vesalius as well. But uh, the fact that there was that the uh, you know that that Paracelsus after his death, his works gave rise to this whole school in Germany and particularly in France, and they became known as the iatro chemists. Um, so the you know chemists who used uh, uh, chemistry for medicine. Um, that you know that really 
you, you really did uh, sort of have to decide whether you were for or against him in a way that didn't really happen with Copernicus um, until Galileo forced the issue, I guess. Um, so, yeah, for a long time, uh, you know, Copernicus's book, I mean, it was famously called the book that nobody read by um, uh, um, the, the oh, uh, Gingerich. Um, <laughs> what's his first name? It's escaped me. Anyway, um, but uh, which was bad. Oh, 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 yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, but um, uh, which was maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but but, you know, not far off. Um, whereas Paracelsus's books, it seems, once they began to be published in the late 16th century, a lot of people read them. Uh, they were very well known and, and highly debated. So, yeah, you know, I think he was absolutely a name that um, was 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 known by scholars and intellectuals and anyone, uh, you know, dealing with medicine in the later part of the century. I was interested in your doctrine of signature. This actually came up last week to some extent when Anna Marie Lou was talking about uh, Newton relationship with an apocryphy and that brought out things like moonwort and those kind of plants. Now, my question here is, but given um, the issue, the idea of signature and so on, did Paracelsus have any influence on in homeopathy? Right. Good question. And I think the uh, the truth is, yes, um, in certainly in the in the very kind of practical sense that his name is invoked uh, in homeopathic circles. Now, I believe there's actually even a homeopathic. Is it a clinic or a school called the Paracelsus School in maybe in Salzburg? Um, uh, it's certainly somewhere in, in, in Switzerland. I remember seeing it. Um, whether his teachings actually supported those ideas is another matter. I mean, he um, he, he did. Uh, he is associated with the homeopathic principle of like cures like that, you know, you can find something uh, to support that idea in his writings. Um, but he's also associated uh, with, with, with the idea that the medicine is, uh, you know, one other of his famous sayings allegedly is the, the, the medicine is in the dose. Um, and so, you know, he's, he's often seen as uh, the, the sort of father of that idea of, you, uh, of, you know, it's not just what you have, it's how much of it you have. Um, now you could read that either way you could read that as well maybe if the dose is small enough you know it's a cure whereas if it's bigger it's poisonous um but uh it, it, it's not clear that for in paracelsus's actual practice anything like that anything like this very sort of high dilution was going on you know i think there was always the notion that the dose had to be right but it also had to be uh there, there had to be something there um so i don't think there's any um evidence at all that paracelsus you know practiced anything uh resembling uh, homeopathy with its sort of high dilution uh, treatments. Um, but some of the ideas, uh, I, I think later homeopathists have, uh, homeopaths have certainly um, uh, mined Paracelsus's works for a kind of a prehistory of, of what they do. Now you mentioned that of course Paracelsus had an impact on chemistry and the power of the principle of flammability between physician and then by Lavoisier disproving position, we create modern chemistry, to put it very, very crudely, very crudely. What would his impact, what is Paracelsus' impact on modern medicine? I mean, does Paracelsus have any impact on the medicine we know today, or is it just uh, that he moved away from the classical authority? Well, I, I don't think one could say that he really found any cures. And in fact, some of the um, some of the medicines that he does describe are fairly fearsome. You know, he'd use uh, things like sulfuric acid, which uh, at that time was it was known how to make it. And uh, uh, um, he he would uh, I mean, it was widely mercury was widely prescribed at that uh, stage to cure syphilis, which was actually a, a disease that appeared during Paracelsus's lifetime, or at least it became prominent during Paracelsus's lifetime. And the common idea is that it was brought back from the uh, from the, the, the new world, um, although that's still discussed. Um, 
but, and uh, so, you know, Paracelsus uh, uh, also recommended mercury cures of, of various sorts. Um, uh, and I, I, yeah, so I, I don't think um, it, it's possible to identify any cures that we still use now. Antimony uh, was an interesting one. He recommended, I think he was one of the people who recommended the use of antimony, uh, antimony as a cure. And in fact, this became a big source of controversy in the late 16th century um, amongst French doctors in particular. People sometimes talk about the antimony wars of, you know, is it a cure or isn't it? I mean, uh, we now know that, of course, it's mildly toxic. And uh, I think it's also a, um, a, a, a basically a laxative. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so so you know that was an example of uh, the use of these what were really uh, these new metals being discovered or semi metals in that case being discovered um, uh, through mining that were being you know used as medicine. Um, so uh, there, there were there were innovations that he, that he introduced that haven't really st stood the test of time. I think really. Um, when I see him cited um, uh, for uh, in discussions of you know modern chemotherapies, it really is in the sense of dosage. The the idea that well, first of all, the idea that you have to get the dose right, and secondly, the idea the specificity of medicines, so that you know you you yeah you don't have you don't use these sort of general all purpose cures like I showed earlier on a picture of theriac, which was the classical medieval cure all. Um, it had all kinds of things in, including vipers skin. Some people say, um, and for Paracelsus, you know things like that weren't going to do the job. You had to find the right cure for the 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 for for the right disease. So I think it's those general ideas that are now cited in in modern medicine as as being kind of transformative. Yes, Marco Tadia from Italy mentioned that bioalchemy sounds interesting. And this reminds me that when I was writing about alchemy, I don't normally write about alchemy, but I did do something a while ago in which the last remaining form of alchemy that I could find is what's called herbal alchemy. And I believe it still has quite a strong influence on German medicine. I mean, certainly if you go into a German pharmacy, you should, you see far more herbal cures than you would do in an English chemist. But on the other hand, to my, to my mind, that seemed to actually go against Paracelsus because, as I understood it, Paracelsus moved away from herb, as you say, into chemical medicine. So I don't know to what extent the German liking for herbs had anything to do with Paracelsus or not. It's really hard to generalize, Peter, about um, uh, you know what Paracelsus did and didn't do um, because it, it, he was so diverse. So he did, learn, you know, as I said, he, he learned about herbs. He knew that herbs were used as cures, and I think he did use them as as cures as well as using you know chemical metals and uh, inorganic compounds. And in fact, you can find him uh, occasionally prescribing bloodletting. Uh, you know, uh, like the old humoral um, uh, 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 belief would 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 recommend. So it's you know, even if he was moving away from those ideas, it was he, you could, it's almost as though he sort of oscillates back and forth and sometimes uses some of these old ideas. So yeah, it is very very hard to generalize in what he used, but I do believe that amongst the cures that he recommended, there would have been herbal ones. One final question. I've been asked to ask, um, did he have, did he work form the basis of aromatherapy? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, uh, I can't think of any instance that I came across of anything that would kind of correspond to that. Um, hmm. But uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, it was, you know, at this time, people were very engaged in distilling essential oils or spirits um, or, or ethers even, as they were often called. Um, so I imagine it's possible, but I, I, I can only say that I didn't encounter anything like that myself. OK, well, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you once again to showing us how in the Renaissance and the early modern period, people moved away from the classical authority, but they hadn't yet found a, re a proper replacement for them. It was a period of turmoil and doubt and change.
at the Reformation itself. So, so thank you for describing that period to us and a leading figure in it, Paracelsus, in such vivid detail. So once again, Philip, thank you very much. That's and great. thank you very much, everybody, for coming. We carry on next month with a talk on the history of astrochemistry. And then after that, we'll be having a talk about alchemy itself from Peter Forshaw from the University of Amsterdam. So for now, goodbye, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the rest of the weekend. And Philip, once again, thank you very much. Pleasure. Bye thank for you. Now. All right. Bye.